Welcome to this lecture number 34 on this NPTEL course on fluid mechanics for undergraduate chemical engineering students. In the last lecture we completed the topic uh, discussion on the topic of potential flows wherein we showed that by constructing a solution for potential flow past a cylinder okay, we showed that the net force exerted on the cylinder by the fluid is 0. Okay. And this is at odds with experimental observations because experimentally no matter how high the Reynolds number is there is always a finite force on a cylinder, but the potential flow approximation tells us that the force is identically 0 that was called the D Alembert's paradox. The resolution to this uh, paradox is that one uh, and which I pointed out in the last lecture itself is that um, since we have neglected viscous effects completely in the inverse picture okay, somehow viscous effects have to come in back come back in at even at high Reynolds numbers. And the way it comes in is through the implementation of no slip condition because if you remember when we went from the Navier Stokes equation to the Euler equation we told that it is impossible to satisfy both the boundary conditions uh, both the normal velocity condition as well as the tangential velocity condition uh, at a given solid surface. So, we sort of uh, went ahead without satisfying the no slip condition, but the no slip condition uh, is valid regardless of uh, what the Reynolds number is. So, it is valid uh, even at very high Reynolds numbers. So, at very high Reynolds numbers one has to satisfy the no slip condition, but that is not possible within the potential flow theory. Therefore, there must be a region very close to the solid surface where the velocity gradients must be very very high, because the velocity will vary from whatever it was at its free stream value that is far away from the uh, solid surface and it will come rapidly to 0. And that region is called the boundary layer and once the boundary layer is taken into account then it is possible to predict non-zero finite forces um, on solid surfaces. And that is the topic of discussion for today that is boundary layer theory. Okay. Now, one another um, indicator that the inviscid flow theory is extremely flawed is the following. Uh, suppose you look at the pressure variation, okay. I am plotting here P minus P0 on the surface of the sphere by half rho V square. P0 is the far pressure far away from the sphere. So, this is the difference between the pressure on the surface of the sphere minus the pressure far away divided by half rho v squared where v is the free stream velocity. So, the coordinate system is like this ok. We have the cylinder ok and imagine that the flow is far away in this x direction ok. And uh, we are trying to measure theta like this ok. So, this is theta is 0, this is theta is pi by 2 and if you come around the full half circle theta is pi. I am plotting here pressure as a function of theta ok. I will plot two curves what is observed in what is done in the what is predicted by the potential flow theory. So, theta is 0, theta is pi by 2, theta is pi ok. And what is predicted by the potential flow theory is something like this ok. So, let me draw ok. So, the potential flow theory predicts that the pressure is the pressure is a maximum here and here ok at theta equal to 0 and theta equals pi. So, and it is symmetric. So, the values are the same and it is a minimum at theta equals pi by 2 ok. So, the pressure curve will be completely symmetric uh, about the theta equals pi by 2 line ok. And of course, there will be similar pressure from the it will also be symmetric about this axis also because that is that is a symmetry due to geometry. But this symmetry is because of the fact that the potential flow equations uh, dictate that symmetry ok. Now, these are this is the potential flow prediction. What happens in reality if somebody measures uh, the pressure as a function of the theta direction like this ok. So, I am going to show that 
in this green curve. So, it turns out that the green curve follows the prediction somewhat up to a point here. So, up to here the green curve and the orange curve they agree with each other, but after that okay, these are the, the green curve is the experimental data. The after that the green curve does not agree with uh, the, uh, the potential flow prediction. Okay. Now, because of the symmetry of this potential flow pressure distribution we found that the force exerted by the uh, fluid on the sphere is 0, but in reality if the pressure distribution is as indicated by the green curve you can already imagine that if you integrate this pressure over the surface of the sphere we may not get a 0 answer. Okay. Because the pressure on this side of the sphere this is let us let us draw this again what what experiments are telling is that pressure on this side of the sphere is very the pressure distribution on this side of the sphere is very different from the pressure distribution on this side of the sphere. So, if you integrate the pressure distribution okay, then you, you can uh, guess or you can predict that you can you can foresee that it is actually going to be non zero. So, that will give rise to a non zero force okay, if you use the pressure distribution that is actually found in experiments, but the potential flow says that the pressure distribution is completely symmetric about uh, the theta equals pi by 2 line. So, therefore, you got a 0 answer. So, this force due to pressure asymmetry on the fore and aft of the sphere okay, is called form drag. Okay, this is only purely due to the asymmetry in pressure. Now, the reason why that happens is that the reason why the pressure deviates from uh, the potential the, the pressure actually uh, the actual pressure the green line actually agrees quite well with the orange line up to a point here. Okay. But after that it starts uh, deviating the reason is the reason for uh, this phenomenon is what is called flow separation. We will discuss this little in detail a little later. So, and this is what causes the pressure the flow that was following the surface of the um, cylinder it essentially deviates it takes off from the surface of the cylinder and that is the reason why the flow separates in a potential flow okay. and that causes the pressure so to vary significantly. Okay. And the reason why flow separates itself is because of viscous effects. So, I will come to that um, as we go along. Okay. Now, there are objects where you can prevent flow separation. So, how to prevent flow separation? Well, these objects are called streamlined objects. So, an example of that is the cross section of an airplane wing which is called an airfoil. This is essentially the cross section of an airplane wing. So, if you look at a flow past such an object. Okay. Um, so, let me draw it more straight. Okay. If you draw the flow past such an object then the flow will tend to follow the contours of the body more faithfully than in the case of flow past a cylinder and that is because of the fact that the geometry of the body is such that the, the geometry of the body is such that flow separation does not occur the flow separation is prevented in streamlined bodies. So, in streamlined bodies the form drag is minimal compared to objects like spheres or cylinders where there is a significant form drag the form drag is itself due to the pressure asymmetry between the fore and aft of a symmetric body like a cylinder. And why that pressure asymmetry occurs in experiments is because of flow separation which we will come to shortly. Now, we will get back to why what is the reason for boundary layers, why do you need boundary layers and where do they occur. Okay. 
Now, as I have told you, suppose you look at an air foil, flow past an air foil, which is a streamlined object, where we need not worry about flow separation. Suppose I look at a tiny zone and blow it up, essentially you will have something like this. Okay. You will have a slightly curved object and fluid is flowing. Okay. Now, you would expect the fluid flow to be uniform, okay. that is the fluid is flowing with some velocity, but at the surface of the airfoil, the fluid has to obey no slip condition. So, it has to come to 0 velocity boundary condition. So, there is a zone demarcated by this orange line, where viscous effects are becoming important, because of the fact that the velocity fluid velocity, which was uniform okay, far away from the surface of the airfoil or, or this surface okay, has to obey the no slip condition. So, there must be a region of uh, fastly varying velocity, rapidly varying velocity. Now, that is called the boundary layer. Now, what has rapidly varying, uh, rapidly varying velocity got to do with uh, viscous stresses? The answer is simple, because if you remember the viscous stress is mu times d v x by d y in a simple setting. Suppose, this is the flow direction, this is the y direction. If there is a velocity gradient in the x velocity in the y direction, Okay, that is this quantity. If this, see what we said in inverse flows is that the viscosity was small. Okay, when the viscosity is small, we said that we can neglect shear stresses. But that was based on the assumption that this quantity, the velocity gradients are not large. But we just showed that there are physical reasons to believe that close to a solid surface, the velocity gradients can be large because the velocity has to go very quickly from its free stream value back to 0 at the surface. So, when this becomes large, when in some sense the viscosity is small, although we have to non dimensionalize to make this argument more concrete, which I will do in a minute, but this is more like a very quick justification as to why viscous shear stresses become important in the bond layer, because you are multiplying a large quantity by a small quantity and not you are not multiplying a small quantity by another moderate quantity, so that you can neglect shear stresses. So, the shear stresses become finite in the boundary layer. So, that is the key reason why shear stresses become important and that is the, the origin of the boundary layer is the necessity to satisfy the no slip condition regardless of how high the Reynolds number is. Okay. Now, what has the boundary layer got to do with separation? The answer uh, comes in the following way. Suppose you consider flow past a cylinder. Okay. As per inviscid flow theory, okay, if you draw the pressure profile, okay, if you draw the velocity profile, so this is the line of symmetry. If you draw the velocity profile, it is going to be like this. It is going to be completely symmetric about the this is theta is 0, this point, this theta is pi by 2. So, the velocity profile and pressure profile are exactly symmetric about theta equals pi by 2 line, this is called 4 aft symmetry. Now, if I look at the flow as it comes in this direction, this point A, the flow velocity comes to 0, because it is completely normal at the surface of the cylinder, there is no velocity. So, as per Bernoulli equation, the pressure here is a stagnation pressure, it is the so, this is P naught plus half V squared, but V squared is 0. Okay. Now, if you go from here, okay, from here to, so th this pressure, okay, which we already know from the previous uh, uh, classes example, the previous class we actually discussed what is a potential flow past a sphere, we found what is a pressure distribution and the pressure distribution, which I will write down again. So, P at the surface minus p naught is rho u squared by 2 times 1 minus 4 sin squared theta. Okay. So, this is the pressure at the surface of the sphere and if u is 0 okay, at this point there is uh, okay, at this point sorry we have to just set theta at a theta equals 
pi and sin pi is nothing but 0. Okay. So, at A you get the pressure minus p naught is maximum it is rho u squared by 2. All the kinetic energy head that was here. So, far away if you use the Bernoulli equation far away the pressure is p naught plus half p naught by rho plus half u squared and that must be equal to the pressure at the stagnation point which is p at the point A by rho plus 0 because there is no velocity. So, clearly p at the point A minus p naught is half rho u squared. This is purely from Bernoulli equation and that exactly agrees with the potential flow solution. right? So, the pressure is maximum here. Now, as the fluid flows if you just trace the fluid along the surface of the cylinder here the velocity see here the velocity is 0 the pressure is maximum from Bernoulli principle. Now, as the fluid flows along this line here the velocity becomes maximum and the pressure at point B okay, the pressure at point B becomes minimum this is point B the pressure becomes the minimum. Okay. Now, and then if you follow from point B to point C okay, here the velocity is maximum pressure is minimum again it has to come to velocity minimum and pressure maximum. So, here this region from B to C is an adverse pressure gradient it is a region of adverse pressure gradient because the fluid is moving from a region of low pressure to high pressure. Now, in the potential flow that is possible because the fluid is losing its kinetic energy. So, there is an interconversion perfect interconversion between the kinetic energy and pressure head as the fluid moves along this point, but what the potential flow theory neglects is the viscous effects. So, as if you include viscous effects close to the surface within the bound layer, then the fluid the viscous effects will tend to retard the fluid because of friction, viscous friction. So, at some point because the fluid is trying to push by virtue of its kinetic energy and the kinetic energy is reducing because it is being converted to pressure head as the fluid particle is traveling at some point along the surface the because of viscous effects the kinetic energy or the velocity will come to a still that is it will become 0. At this point the fluid will no longer continue to follow the cylinder because the fluid that is flowing adjacent will tend to pull off the fluid particles away from the surface of the cylinder. So, this is called flow separation and the region where the flow has separated you will find what are called wakes okay. and this is the reason why we have flow separation in flow past uh, objects like spheres or cylinders because of the pressure distribution uh, that is present in the inviscid potential flow that get that gives rise to adverse pressure gradient in the aft side suppose you look at this side it is a region of uh, so let us draw this line this is a region of adverse pressure gradient. Okay, while this is a region of favorable pressure gradient. And as the fluid particle moves from here as it moves here okay, viscous effects become important close to the solid surface for reasons I just explained okay, because the velocity gradients are larger. So, it tends to retard the fluid particle at some point the fluid particle will come to a halt and then the fluid that is flowing away and adjacent to it will tend to pull it apart okay. it is not able to follow the contour of the geometry. So, this is called flow separation, okay. but such a a uh, phenomenon is not possible in streamlined bodies because this adverse pressure gradient region does not develop in streamlined bodies. This, so, this idea of reducing the flow separation is called streamlining in fluid mechanics. Okay. So, now let us go to the estimation of bond layer size or thickness of the bond layer by non dimensionalizing the Navier-Stokes equation. Estimate the bond layer thickness. Okay. So, imagine we have so for the present to discuss bond layers we will not worry about uh, bodies such as cylinders or spheres because we know that 
flow separation happens when flow separation happens okay as i just indicated in the last okay the flow separates from the body and there is a huge region where viscous effects become important that's called the wake so our original proportion that viscous effects are not important in the bulk of the flow at higher nos numbers becomes invalid so we have to actually now therefore um, not consider this kind of problems wherein the flow separates but if you consider a streamlined body like an airfoil okay okay flow past an airfoil then flow separation is prevented and then we can just imagine that the effect of viscous viscosity will be viscous effects will become confined only close to the surface of the solid and therefore you can actually use the boundary layer theory to predict forces okay so in order to do that in order to estimate the thickness of the boundary layer i'm going to blow up this part okay locally this is going to appear like a flat surface because the thickness of the boundary layer is very small compared to the radius of curvature of the solid okay so you have an xy plane okay and there is flow uniform flow and close to the solid surface this is the bond layer where viscous effects become important okay now how are we going to estimate the thickness what is the thickness okay now if you remember when we non dimensionalized the navier stokes equation previously we used uh, let's imagine that the length of the air foil or some um, typical thickness of the air foil is l we had used the fast stream velocity u as the velocity scale and this l as the length scale in non dimensionalizing the navier stokes equation okay but the variations in the direction perpendicular to the boundary layer the length l is immaterial it's not important it is not the characteristic length scale for variation of velocity in the direction normal to the surface of the solid therefore we have to rescale the problem okay because the natural length scale for variation of velocity in the bond layer is not the thickness of the air foil or the length of the air foil it is a new length scale that will emerge from our problem okay so what we'll do is we will say so we will rescale the navier stokes equation the x direction the flow direction we will use the the length scale l in the y direction we will use a new length scale delta where delta is the thickness of the bond layer which will be determined shortly okay this is the bond layer thickness how are we going to estimate this we're going to substitute this back in the navier stokes equation and again do the non dimensionalization okay when we do that we will find so the dimensional navier stokes equation for this simple two dimensional problem steady problem becomes the x momentum equation okay is equal to minus partial p partial x plus mu partial y square okay plus mu partial squared vx by partial x square now upon using x star is x by l y tilde is y by delta okay and all the velocities vx star is vx by um, u vy star is vy by u and so on if you do that okay so what you will get okay so first we will have to worry about what is vy star how to non dimensionalize the the normal velocity so let's first write down the continuity equation in cartesian coordinates okay in the x we have chosen the velocity scale to be u and the length scale to be l plus in the y direction we don't know what the velocity scale is let us call it uh, some v and the length scale is delta so unless v is u times 
delta by L okay, this equation will not be satisfied. So, this implies the continuity equation implies that the scale for velocity is this. So, you can imagine that the velocity in the x direction is u times delta by L. Since the bond layer is very very thin we will show that delta by L is small compared to 1 we can say that the normal velocity is very very small compared to the tangential velocity. Okay, so, when we use this all this information back in the x momentum equation you will find that V x star partial V x star by partial x star plus V y star partial V x star partial y tilde is equal to minus partial P star by partial x star plus 1 over R e partial squared V x star by partial x star squared plus 1 over R e L squared by delta squared partial squared V x star by partial y star squared. Okay. Because we are using a different length scale for non dimensionalizing the y coordinate we are getting this new term. Now, we are going to consider the limit Reynolds number large compared to 1 because we are in the uh, business of dealing with high Reynolds number flows. So, this term is indeed small. Okay. But, when you look at this term you get a combination this is the gradient of velocity in the y direction okay. you get 1 over R e times L squared by delta square. Okay. Now, in order to satisfy the no slip condition we need to incorporate this term otherwise if this term becomes small we will not be able to satisfy the no slip condition. Therefore, we demand that this should be similar to 1 otherwise this term will become smaller. So, this gives rise to the result that delta by L whole squared should be proportional to 1 over R e or delta by L should be proportional to R e to the power minus half. So, this is an estimate of bond layer thickness and as I had claimed before it since Reynolds number is large 1 over Reynolds number is small and 1 over root of Reynolds number is small. So, this is indeed small compared to 1. So, the bound layer is indeed a very thin region compared to any other relevant dimensions of the of the physical problem such as the length of the airfoil or the thickness of the airfoil or uh, things like that. So, it is indeed very small compared to the other physical geometrical lengths of the problem and it is therefore, the bound layer can be said to be confined very close to the solid surface where the velocity varies very rapidly to satisfy the no slip condition. Okay. Now, the next step for us is to see how to predict shear stresses. Once we have realized that um, the bound layer is important then we have to go ahead and see what is the how to predict viscous shear stresses and that thereby how to predict drag forces on solid surfaces. In order to do that I am going to use a momentum integral formation integral formulation. This is an approximate method that gives you a reasonably accurate answer. In more advanced classes you will learn how to solve the bound layer theory uh, the bound layer governing how to solve the Navier Stokes equations within the bound layer approximation uh, using suitable uh, techniques mathematical techniques and that gives you a more rigorous solution to the problem but that is beyond the scope of the present uh, introductory course. So, we will remain content by using a rather approximate method, but which is uh, deeply rooted in the physics of the problem and that gives reasonably accurate results also. Okay. What we are going to do is to consider a flat plate, because remember the bound layer is very very thin. So, even if you have a curved geometry locally that is going to appear like a flat plate on the scale of the bound layer thickness. Now, I am going to consider a control volume a differential control volume and do a momentum balance about it. Okay. The control volume is like this okay, of distance d x length d x okay. now let us call this phase a b and c and d and the bound layer thickness in general is a function of the distance along the flow direction. So, flow is like this. So, flow is like this happening like this and this is my control volume a b c d. Okay. Now, we are given how the flow varies outside the bound layer these are the potential flow solutions. 
remember outside the bound layer the potential flow solutions are valid. So, we are given that information and we want to find what is delta of x okay. and I will claim that after you find what is delta of x we can find the forces the viscous stresses and so on. First let do let us do a mass balance we will do a mass balance across this control volume a b c d okay. important to note here that this is not a streamline the b c is not a streamline not a streamline it is merely an imaginary boundary that separates the bound layer from the outside inverted free stream flow okay. So, that is uh, it is not a streamline. So, all I am trying to imply is that fluid can enter through the surface B C. So, when you do the mass conservation mass conservation uh, mass integral mass balance for this C V then you have to actually take that into account. So, at steady state the mass balance implies A is 0 over all the control surfaces this implies that m dot a b plus m dot b c minus m dot c d is 0. There is no flow across a d because this is an imp the velocity satisfies no normal velocity condition at the surface rigid surface a d. So, this will essentially boil down to this. So, this implies that m dot b c is nothing but m dot minus of m dot a b minus m dot of c d where m dot a b is the mass that enters through this okay, and m dot of c d is the mass that leaves through this. Okay. We have to work out uh, the signs appropriately as we go along. So, m dot a b is nothing but since the unit outward normal is to a b is in the minus i direction because flow is in the plus i direction. So, there has to be a negative sign in calculating the mass flow rate it is nothing but integral 0 to delta rho u d y times w. This is the width into the plane since we are considering that to be a very large quantity. So, we can just multiply all our results by the width to get the appropriate dimensions width into the plane plane of paper or the plane of the boat in which I am writing. Okay. Now, m dot of c d is nothing but okay. So, here for C D the direction of flow and the direction of unit normal are both positive. So, I can write this as W integral 0 to delta rho u d y evaluated at x plus delta x because this is no longer okay at the at the value at x. So, I can write this as m dot at x plus d m dot by d x evaluated at x times d x. Okay. So, m dot c d is nothing but w integral 0 to delta rho u d y plus w d d x of integral 0 to delta rho u d y times d x because delta is a function of x okay, we have to take this. Okay. This is an integral, but the integral is a function of x through the fact that delta is a function of x the upper limit is actually a function of x. So, you get therefore, m dot b c the amount of mass that enters through the top surface b c of the control volume that is this surface where I am showing the yellow lines here m dot b c is nothing but minus w partial partial x of integral 0 to delta of x rho u d y multiplied by d x. Okay. This is m dot b c. Okay. All this is uh, saying is that if delta is a function okay, of if delta is actually a function of x. So, this is delta it is a function of x then m dot b c is actually a negative quantity that is fluid has to leave through the uh, surface b c uh, that is precisely because of the fact that okay, the areas are changing through which the flow is fluid is flowing they are changing. Okay. So, and that is the reason why 
and uh, this is coming out to be negative. Okay. So, momentum balance okay, the momentum balance says that for the C V A B C D okay, says that the sum of all the forces. So, let us write the x momentum balance sum of all the surface forces exerted I mean we neglect body force in our current discussion sum of all the surface forces is equal to the momentum flux, flux at steady state u rho v dot d a. Okay. So, we will come to what the forces are uh, a little later. So, we will first focus on this term this is equal to the momentum flux through a b plus momentum flux through C D plus the momentum flux due to B C. Okay, there are these three phases through which momentum can come in by virtue of flow uh, A D, uh, C D and B C. Okay. These are the three phases and the bottom phase is impermeable, so there is no momentum flux. Okay. So, if we now calculate what are the momentum fluxes due to all these three phases, this is nothing but minus of w times integral 0 to delta u square rho d y c d is nothing but okay, w times integral 0 to delta rho u square d y plus w d d x of integral 0 to delta rho u square d y and here this is nothing but u times m dot b c because the fluid is coming with a constant velocity at the top surface okay. and since the surface is curved the fluid is entering and it will bring in some momentum. So, that momentum is the mass flow rate times the velocity of the fluid which is u times m dot b c but we had just calculated what is m dot b c just now uh, in the previous mass conservation. So, we have calculated what is m dot b c it is here. So, we have to simply use that. So, this is nothing but minus u the partial by partial x of integral 0 to delta rho u d y d x times w. Okay. Now, what are the forces because you have to now worry about the forces on various phases there are pressure forces and there are shear stresses exerted by the solid surface. Okay. Forces on the C V so we have to now worry about what are the forces on the C V let us draw the C V again. So, this is the edge of the pound layer and so we are considering uh, something like this A B C D. So, I will draw A B C D again for you A v c d. So, here there are pressure forces at the phase a b, there are pressure forces on this curved surface b c, there are pressure forces on this straight surface c d and there are viscous shear forces which will tend to drag the fluid in the minus suppose this is the flow direction which is x the normal direction is y. So, there will be shear stresses here. So, these are the four forces that will act on the fluid in the c v. So, let us write down all the forces on the surface a b you have force is pressure times the width into the board times the area uh, the. So, let us just so this is delta at x. So, the force is the pressure times the cross section area the cross section area is w times delta x. The force on the phase c d and this pressure is acting in the plus x direction while the force on the pressure force on the phase C D will be acting in the minus x direction. So, the force is minus after doing a Taylor expansion P plus partial P by partial. So, let me write all the steps for convenience for clarity is P W times delta at x plus delta x at x plus d x. 
okay this is nothing but and minus because force is in the minus x direction this is nothing but minus p plus dp dx at x okay sorry okay dx times minus p at x times w times delta plus d delta because the the boundary layer thickness also will change from delta to delta plus d delta by dx times dx which is nothing but d delta okay so that's what i'm writing here this is the force on the face cd now we have to worry about force on the face bc the curved surface of the top of the edge of the bond layer okay and that's only pressure force what we'll do is to take the average of the pressure here and pressure here okay and divide let's assume that to be the pressure and we have to multiply it by the projected area because it is a curved surface area so we have to multiply it by the area projected on the x direction okay that will be the force so if you do that and it will be in the plus direction because the force is acting along the pressure is acting along the x direction so the average pressure is half p at x plus p at x plus dp dx times dx now we have to multiply it by the projected area which is d delta times w because this change in the bond layer thickness is actually d delta and that multiplied by the width into the paper will give us the uh, force acting on the surface bc now force on ad the bottom surface the viscous shear stress is and the viscous shear stress will tend to act in the minus x direction because it will tend to retard the fluid so fad is tau w at x plus tau w at x plus dx multiplied by uh, w dx okay uh, so this force is acting on us on this force is acting on a strip which is dx and w into the board so but we are taking the average shear stress between the point at x and point at x plus delta x taking the average so that will eventually after taylor expansion this will eventually become tau w at x plus half d tau w okay times and it's in the minus direction so as i've told you so that times w dx now you have to put all these things together okay the net forces the total force in the x direction net in the x direction will be therefore the force on the face ab which is pw delta minus the force on the face cd which is minus p okay plus dp dx dx times w times delta plus d delta okay now plus the force on the face bc which we can simplify it as p at x okay times plus rather half dp dx dx times w times d delta okay that is the projected area minus the shear stress which is uh, tau w plus half d tau w times w dx this is a total net force now that after okay let's cancel out stuff so let's first we have to expand this uh, but we can cancel out just by ready inspection also this p w delta will cancel this p w delta okay so p w delta is gone but there is also another term okay so we'll write down terms that are uh, non zero so we'll get minus p w d delta that will cancel plus p w d delta okay so p w delta cancels with this then p w d delta will cancel okay with this term okay and then you will have terms of the type minus dp dx dx times w times delta so we'll write this down again 
minus d p d x d x w times delta minus d p d x d x w times d delta okay. and then you have plus half d p d x d x w times d delta okay. and finally, you also have the shear stress terms minus tau w w d x minus half d tau w w d x. Okay. Now, we are we are going to throw away terms that are squares of differential. So, this is there is a differential of stress and differential of uh, length this is small. Um, so, this is again small because it is d x d delta small again d x d delta small. So, the only two terms that will survive from the net force is this. Okay. So, you will finally, get the net force in the x direction is nothing but minus d p d x delta d x minus tau w d x whole multiplied by w. Now, this will be equal to the momentum flux if you remember the momentum balance says that the net force is at steady state the net force is equal to the net momentum flux out of the C v. So, that we can simplify it to be d d x of integral 0 to delta of x u squared rho d y okay, times d x minus u d d x of 0 to delta rho u d y times d x and this entire thing is also going to be multiplied by w. Sure enough w should cancel from both sides as they do here otherwise uh, we are in uh, we have made some error in the calculation. But so, clearly w's which are the uh, width into the plane of the paper they must actually cancel out which they do. Okay. Therefore, if you do everything finally, dot what we get is the following okay. minus delta d p d x minus tau w after dividing by w d x in the entire expression is d d x of integral 0 to delta of x rho u square d y well I am for a okay, let us just write that minus u integral d d x of integral rho u d y capital U is the free stream velocity outside the boundary layer. velocity okay, and that is outside the boundary. Now, d p d x is the pressure gradient within the bond layer, but suppose this is the our C v okay. this is the edge of the bond layer and our C v was something like this and d p d x is the pressure variation within the bond layer, but since the bond layer is very very thin usually what happens is the pressure gradient that is outside gets impressed upon the pressure gradient within the bond layer. That is because the pressure variation in the y direction if this is the x direction this is the y direction the pressure variation within the y direction in the bond layer is negligible that is d p d y is 0 within the bond layer. Therefore, we can set d p d x outside as the d p d x within the bound layer, but outside d p d x is nothing but whatever is found from Bernoulli equation. Okay. The Bernoulli equation says that d p d x or the Euler equation which says that d p d x is minus rho u uh, d u d x at steady state the Euler equation for a one dimensional flow like this outside the bound layer the flow is largely one dimensional in the x direction. So, we can treat uh, use the Euler equation to find what is d p d x and also note that delta is integral 0 to delta d y. Uh, so, if you uh, just integrate d y to 0 to delta you get delta. So, you get tau w is we are eliminating every uh, the previous expression for tau w because that is the uh, quantity of interest we want to know what is the wall shear stress 
uh, on a boundary layer flow. Okay, so minus d d x of integral zero to delta u rho u d y. This we already had plus u d d x zero to delta rho small u d y. Okay, plus you had the pressure instead of that I am going to use that Bernoulli equation, wherein I am going to say that it is d u d x okay, times integral 0 to delta rho u d y, because we had just a delta that came in uh, the pressure gradient was multiplied by delta in the previous expression. If you see there is a delta and instead of delta I am going to write this as 0 to delta d y and instead of pressure gradient I am going to use minus rho uh, u d u d x. Okay. This is the simplification that we are doing. Okay. So, the shear stress finally becomes after doing some simplification this becomes. So, we can pull rho u inside the integral because rho u is independent of uh, y okay. that is the reason. So, shear stress becomes d u d x integral 0 to delta rho capital U d y minus d d x of integral 0 to delta u rho u d y plus u d d x of integral 0 to delta rho u d y. Okay. Now, I am going to split the last integral in the following way. Now, I am going to write this as d d x of integral 0 to delta rho u u d y minus d u d x of integral 0 to delta rho u d y. Okay. The last integral can be written like this by product rule, because both u and delta are functions of uh, uh, x. So, here u is out, so I am bringing u in, but then I have to subtract an equivalent term. This is just product rule of two uh, multiplication of two functions. Okay. So, tau w then becomes now if you look at this expression this has similar form like this, but only key difference is this is capital U this is small u. So, I can write rewrite this as is d u d x I will take that as common 0 to delta rho capital U minus small u d y okay, that is one term. Now, the other term will remain the same minus d d x. Okay, so, the other term, so we have this term rho u rho u here you have u rho times capital U. So, I can do a simple manipulation and take this common d d x as common you get 0 to delta u rho times capital U minus small u d y. Okay. So, this is my expression for the shear stress on the surface which is a function of x. The shear stress is not a constant because remember everything is a function of x because delta is a function of x. So, shear stress will general in general be a function of x. Okay. So, I am going to rewrite this slightly. So, tau w is partial by partial x of u square of integral 0 to delta rho okay, u divided by u times 1 minus u divided by u. All I am doing is to take this u out and then I write d d x of d u d x as uh, d d x of u square. Okay. 1 minus u by u d y okay, plus okay, I am sorry there has to be a plus sign here, because I am using uh, capital U first. So, capital U is multiplied by a plus here. Okay. So, it is a capital U has a plus term. So, this is a plus not a minus in this expression. So, plus therefore, u times d u d x of integral 
0 to delta rho times 1 minus u by u dy. I am just rewriting this expression. Now, this expression is important because the moment I tell you what is the velocity profile in the bound layer and what is the free stream velocity profile, we can actually evaluate this integral. Okay. Now, in order to do that, we have to actually solve for the bound layer velocity profile, which is difficult in general. We have to do sophisticated, uh, you have to use sophisticated mathematical techniques to solve the bound layer equations, but here we will be content with doing simple approximations for what is the bound layer velocity profile, which will then give us how the shear stress varies as a function of the distance. We will stop here and we will continue in the next lecture and complete this discussion on momentum boundary layer analysis, integral boundary layer, integral analysis of the boundary layer.